come before you, Lord. We are full of joy. We are full of happiness, Lord God, for this little young girl here, Sophie, that has given her heart to you, Lord. I thank you so much because out of everything, everything, Lord God, that is the most important thing that we can do in our own lives, Lord, is to give our hearts to Jesus. And Sophie has done that this morning. So I just praise you for that. And I pray over her, Lord God, that you would watch over her. You would help us, Lord God, to help her in her walk with you, that we would be able to encourage her and lift her up in our prayers, Lord, each and every day, that, Lord God, she would look to you for direction and, Lord God, and understanding, because this is new to her, Father. So I ask that you would open up her heart and her mind, Lord God, and let her just absorb what you have for her, Lord God. And we thank you for Sophie being here today. It's a wonderful, wonderful day, Lord God, and we rejoice and we celebrate, Lord God. So thank you for that. For all the other requests, Lord God, I ask, Lord God, that you would be with each one. Lord God, that uh, healing in their bodies, uh, their minds, their spirit, Lord God, wherever that needs to take place. The unspoken requests that weren't even spoken, Lord God. I know there's some of those, Father. Um, I pray for... Uh, 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 Kylie, Lord God, and Stephen, Lord, and their disease that they have, Lord God. They tell us there's no cure. They tell the doctors say there's no cure, that there's just medicine. But I disagree. I disagree, and I know we disagree. We know that you are a great healer. We know that you are a provider. So, Lord God, I would ask that you would provide healing, Lord, to their bodies. So wherever that is, that stuff is affecting them, Lord God, I would ask that you would relieve them, first of all, of their pain. And, Lord God, that you would allow that to grow back or whatever needs to be done, taken away or infection, whatever it is, Lord God, that you would take care of those two, Lord God. But the next thing in that family, Lord God, it's a big family, big family, Father. You know that. But anyway that you, Lord God, would bring them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For their souls, Lord God, are the most important thing. Our souls here are the most important thing. So, Father God, I thank you, though, for each prayer request. I thank you for the praises, Lord God, that each one has uh, said. I think about Roger, Lord. Man, what a, what a wonderful thing. I praise you, God, for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But there's others, Lord God, in the congregation that are hurting too, and friends, Lord God, and relatives. So guide and direct them, Lord God, in their path. Let them uh, be healed in Jesus' name, and we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor that you deserve. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Just let me say uh, we have some people missing. They're uh, traveling. Uh, so pray for uh, Mark and Kim as they travel. Yeah. Italy. They went to Italy. I just say they went to Europe because I don't know where all of the places are going over there. And uh, Larry, he should be, he's back in town, or he's going to be back in town probably hopefully next week. So uh, he's been gone as well. I will also say that the next few weeks are going to be a little bit different. Uh, today we're going to do start off with some... Uh, Christmas material, which is not always my favorite because it's not always the easiest, but uh, we're going to get through it because you guys are going to be the worship team this morning as well, so okay, and f we don't have a bass player, so this is, some of you are going to have to go boom, 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 okay, anyway, let's start off. Blessed be your name. 
Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, those pain in your offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to stay, Lord blessed be your name.
to die. Give me Jesus. Give me to show that we do cast our cares, including our financial cares on the Lord. And we are walking in obedience as we give and we are blessed even as we surrender our, our cash, our money, along with the rest of our lives. So let's pray for our offering this morning that God will use it to further his kingdom and to further his expression of love in this place. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have blessed us in so many ways and that in among those ways is by meeting our financial needs. And those needs that haven't been met yet, Lord, we trust you for. And we know that your heart rejoices in a cheerful giver and so this morning we give cheerfully to your work in this place thank you jesus bless each and every giver in jesus name amen
Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to start off this morning with a responsive reading, and it's up on the screen. So if we'd all stand, and just to clarify, this is the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side, and we all know which are the men and which are the women. Okay. Last week, we lit the candle of hope. And today we gather to light the candle of peace. Come, Lord Jesus, drive out all darkness that hides your glorious face. Amen. There we go. <laughs> Women, please. Peace to the armies. Peace to those who feel far from you. Bring peace to those who suffer alone. Come, we invite you, Lord Jesus, to renew our commitment to your peace. And all together, we bow our heads to receive your gift of peace. God of light, today we step out of our present darkness to light the candle of peace, both on this table and in our hearts. We know that we will find your direction as we allow your word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, for our hope is in you. In this Advent season and always, we adore you. You may remain standing. Please remain standing, if you can, for the reading of the scripture from today, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, and follow along with me. Nevertheless, in that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms blood-stained by war will all be burned. They will be as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called one, say it with me, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Lord, make us filled with passionate commitment as we learn of your ways today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every Sunday I am so blessed to hear how God is working in your lives. To know that God is not dead, nor does he sleep. 
And as we consider the bells of the Christmas season, as we consider these things, God is present. God is near. And we thank him for his closeness. Oh, God does not need all this flim-flam we have around us. But it sure is nice to have folks who work hard to give us what we need to worship well. Makes it easier for us when we don't have to flip those pages and find those passages. It makes it clearer for us to participate together in worship when we have these wonderful tools. And that, too, is a love gift from people in the congregation to each other. I want to take time to thank people who made this all happen this morning for the hours that they put into it, for Richard and Connie and Pastor Jim especially, who gave up their Saturday to heal the electronic features of our worship now, last week I didn't have one at all. Today I have a brand new system going on. So be patient with me if I give you the wrong picture at the wrong time, but we're trying, okay? <laughs> so this Sunday's message fits really well with last week's message of hope. You're going to hear some of the same thoughts and ideas and and your heart's going to respond to some of the same things. And I think that it fits so well together, at least in part, because God's hope for us is peace. From the garden, God has planned to restore peace to his people. Peace between God, himself, and all of humanity between humans and humans, especially between men and women, because that's kind of where the rift all got started. God has planned to restore peace between humans and the earth to make women and men better stewards of the earth, as he tasked us with in the beginning, to be agents of healing of the land. And finally, God has planned to heal the internal rift we sometimes experience with ourselves. The shame, the uncertainty, the failure to appreciate that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. It occurred to me, as I was thinking about last week, that I used the word redeem many times in the sermon. And it's a good word, but it's a word that may need just a little bit of fleshing out. A little bit of meat on the bones. So I go to this image. <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> well, you know exactly why. Whenever I think of redeemed, I think of blue chip stamps. And I especially remember blue chip stamps around Christmas time. For those of you who have memories of uh, S&H green stamps, or for those of you who have no memories of stamps at all, <laughs> let, me, let me kind of just track that. In the old days, instead of running your card through the cash register to track your purchases, instead, merchants used to give stamps that you could take home, lick, lick, <laughs> and put in a book to save. The stamps in themselves were pretty worthless, except maybe to entertain kids as their parents put the groceries away. But when they were collected over the year, you could take them to the redemption center and you could get all kinds of cool things like this copper kettle that I got for my grandma one Christmas. Basically these books full of nothing but paper, spit, and hope, <laughs> could be transformed into treasures. 
And spiritually, redemption is a little like that, too. Something of very humble potential, and maybe even difficult, is transformed into treasure. God, who knows the value of each little stamp of our lives, and who knows the whole book that's made up of all the little stamps, can turn them into something amazing. God, who knows the value of each experience in our lives, can turn them into something purposeful and in harmony with his purpose of redemption. God has already redeemed all kinds of seemingly useless things in my life and turned them into something only God could make. How about you? Yeah? Have you been redeemed, changed by your creator? Yeah. And are you being redeemed more day by day, even today? So if you've seen redemption in your life, that can add a lot to your sense of peace. Peace based on faith that the same God who redeemed your past is redeeming your present. Because no matter what today's experience looks like, God can use that to bring something of value to this world as well as for yourself. He is a good God, yes? Oh, louder. Thank you, because I've noticed on those tapes that you can't always hear you. <laughs> so loud and proud, guys. <laughs> so you see there's a link between last week's message of hope and this week's message of peace. And there's a lot to unpack in that passage. It's way too big for us to cover in full. So we're going to focus on the one small part. Prince of Peace. The Messiah is the Prince of Peace. And we're going to draw on passages throughout Scripture to consider how Christ brings peace in three specific ways. Three specific areas where we may see a lack of peace in our world, in our lives. The concept of peace is another one of those elephant things we have to walk around as we come to understand the enormity of God. Peace can be seen as the opposite of chaos or disorder. Peace can also be seen as the absence of conflict or at least the ability to manage conflict productively. But the Hebrew word in the passage that we read has the same root as the word shalom. And shalom has gotten to be fairly common in our English usage. And it's used across religions. And to offer an oversimplification of what shalom means, shalom is beyond the absence of conflict, beyond the opposite of disorder. It's a positive word. And it has to do with fullness of life, with well-being, healing, wholeness. And I love that understanding. Because wholeness can exist even where there's conflict, even when there's chaos, and where there's disorder. Because wholeness can face down any of those things things and still be whole. I also appreciate that this word has been adopted into our English language because 
It really fits well with one of Jesus' own descriptions of his Messiahship, found in John 10.10. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus' own messianic purpose, Prince of Peace, Redemption, Life More Abundant. So where is it that we need peace? Where do you need peace today? I'm going to suggest this morning that peace with God is reflected specifically in three ways in our lives as we seek to follow the Messiah. There are three eyes to help you remember, of Christian expressions of peace and ways that Christians participate in the plan of redemption in the world. Are you ready? Ready for these? We need peace internationally, interpersonally, and internally. Peace in the world Sinful people are inherently warmongers. One researcher who hoped to understand previous periods of world peace so that we could build on those principles in today's world looked at 3,400 years of history. And do you know what she found? She identified only 268 conflict-free years. Less than 8% of recorded history. Yep, the wages of sin is death. Death to world peace, death to shalom, death to peace between persons. Experts tell us that most conflict interpersonally comes from personality, and preference differences. We want to have things our way, and we want to be right. It comes from misunderstandings. And because we think we are right, it makes us almost blind to see somebody else's rightness. And competition. It's not enough to be enough. It's not enough to have enough. We want to be the best. We want the most. And we want often at the expense of our relationships with one another. And finally, we lack peace within ourselves. We experience guilt and shame and comparison and loneliness, and anxiety, and anger, and inadequacy, and fear, I could go on. It occurred to me this week that one of the major disruptions in peace in our lives is because when we have a plan, there is one way that it's going to be right, and a million ways it could go wrong. And so if we find ourselves frequently out of peace, it's often because we're focused on that one way and 999,999 other things could happen to interfere with our plan. <laughs> well, let's start out with taking a little bit deeper look at the idea of world peace. The prophet Isaiah, let's go back to our biblical passage. The prophet Isaiah is really clear in chapter 9 that the work of the Messiah is to bring Gentiles into the redemptive plan. And who are the Gentiles? We are. We are. Everyone who was not born into Jewish heritage. God's plan of redemption is for all people in all eras, in all places, to experience divine peace. 
You are included. But you know what? You're not the only one. God has been planning for the redemption of people from every nation and tongue to have equality around the throne of God and equality now. There's a song that really resonates with God's creation declaration. It is good. You probably won't find it in a hymnal. But I want, you to, I want to share it with you this morning as we consider the vastness of our Prince of Peace. This is going to be quite a feat. Connie, not sure it's here. Can't you just hear the Lord God echoing those words? Words, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. 
And through the Messiah, God has privileged everyone and no one. We come into the presence of the Prince of Peace as beloved equals. And while our experiences are diverse across national borders, God has planned for the peace of us all. And Jesus tells his followers, blessed are the peacemakers. And you know, you may think, Pastor, I don't have much chance from late in California of affecting world peace. <laughs> Mother Teresa once said, peace begins with a smile. And those smiles are beautiful and they encourage us to smile back. And some of you are still smiling. Look at each other. But smiling is only the beginning. And as we grow in our love for Jesus, we must grow in our love and appreciation for our wide and wonderful world, which is a really good thing to remember as we are faced with people whose language or culture may make us uncomfortable, including telephone customer service representatives, we may have a hard time understanding. So put a smile in your voice in the name of Jesus and move the needle just a little bit closer towards the Prince of Peace. But truly, smiling is also a good starter for interpersonal relationships and interpersonal peace, peace between individuals. Sometimes that when we are, when we are looking at all the things that are causing a lack of peace between us, like those things that we mentioned in the beginning, a sense of humor can really be helpful for us. Because if we take a look at those big four sources of conflict, personality and preference differences, misunderstandings, competition, especially competition over a perceived lack of resources, sometimes we can think of the bounty of God and laugh at ourselves a little bit for falling into such predictable patterns, for being so, so human. But there are other times when smiling is not enough. Sometimes the path to peace is paved with pain. The sources of our conflict are much more significant than misunderstandings. And sometimes smiling can really be a great disservice, a great dishonesty and really unkindness. Because one of the saddest things I've seen in relationships is to hide a deep, painful truth behind a shallow smile. In interpersonal issues, I'm reminded of a preschool chant that I used to do with my preschoolers. Can't go over it. Can't go under it. Can't go around it. Got to go through it. And the Bible tells us that if we come to worship and we remember that someone has ought with us, we must first be reconciled. And that is no smiling matter. Telling the truth first to ourselves and then to another in repentance can be painful. Does that mean that we have to go through a laundry list of offenses and share an itemized list of everything we can think of that might have offended that person or harmed them? Probably not. We might just be naming things that just increase the pain. So the rule of thumb is to identify the feeling, to acknowledge one's part in causing harm, to allow the other person 
to respond or question. And then finally, finally, to cry together, not just smile, so that we can move on into peace. And interior peace is also often painful. We're often less gracious with ourselves than we would be with anyone else. We forget that the same compassion and mercy that we would extend to others, Christ has already extended to us. And there are two scriptures that are particularly meaningful to me in light of self-condemnation. So here are these words today. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Can I hear it again? Hmm. Of course, we don't use our forgiveness as an opportunity to sin. We avail ourselves of the power of God to overcome temptation. But that temptation includes being tempted to dredge up against ourselves what God has already released us from. In the words of Princess Elsa, we need to let it go because the great Prince of Peace already has let it go. Thank you, Jesus. Of course, that's only one area of internal peace that God offers. But, you know, it seems to be one that I see Christians struggling with regularly. And it interferes with shalom, well-being, wholeness in Christ. So how can we have this internal peace My friend Barth shared with me this week on Facebook a prayer of abandonment to God that's attributed to Blessed Charles. I don't know who Blessed Charles is, but I certainly appreciate his words. And I'm going to share his prayer with you this morning as a model of peace. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me, as in all your creatures. I ask no more than this, my Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you, O Lord with all the love of my heart. For I love you, my God, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with total confidence. For you are my Father, and you have given the Prince of Peace. I added that last part. (laughs) And perhaps before we conclude the service, you'd like to seek or to express that kind of peace this morning. Maybe your heart's been crying out to submit yourself, to submit yourself to the peace that only God can give. We are what I 
think of as an altar anchoring people. We bring our burdens to this place and we leave them there. We drop the anchor and leave it there. So if you would like to anchor some things to the altar this morning, it's open to you to pray alone or to pray with others in your church family. And before we end with a concluding responsive reading, I'm going to pray that prayer again. And I'm going to ask you to close your eyes just in case anyone would like to come forward. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me, as in all your creatures. I ask no more than this, my Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you, O Lord, with all the love of my heart. For I love you, my God, and so need to give myself to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with total confidence. For you are my Father who has given the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Pastor Ken, lead us in responding and a blessing to send us out. Let us stand. Today we have lit the candle of peace. Come, Lord Jesus, make our hearts alive with your peace. Ladies, let us. Remind us of armies that are higher than coal. Let us speak. Left side. <laughs> let us speak peace. Come. We invite you, Lord Jesus, to renew our commitment to your peace. Your hand to receive your benediction of peace. May your feet be swift to carry the gospel of peace in every area of your life. May you give grace to smile in peace, courage to weep for peace, and compassion as you accept peace as your own gift. May our peace overflow to others and find them hungry to know this peace for themselves. May you see the Prince of Peace reign and rule in your heart and mind as you walk in the light of this Advent season. Go in peace to love and serve God and others. Amen.